Uh. Uh oh. <laughs> um. So I was coming here to get a thumbnail for the previous episode. The previous episode, in which we spent most of the episode. <laughs> At least as far as the Kaled portion, we spent a considerable amount of time in the Divine Tower of Kaled. So I figured, okay, there's a line of sight here that, you know, we'll be able to get a beautiful photo of the Divine Tower of Kaled from there. What I didn't anticipate <laughs> was warping here and finding Grank to be aggroed. Hmm. Quite the pickle. Hi. Oh. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I can't even do the greeting. I'm sorry, everyone. I don't know what we did. I wonder if it's because we have the rune now. Oh my goodness. Hi, hello everyone, <laughs> this is Aegon of Astora, and welcome back to my blind playthrough of Elden Ring. This is episode number 38, being recorded on Sunday the 2nd of April, 2023. I hope you're all having a fantastic day, whenever it is you find yourself watching this. So, <laughs> oh, so in addition to getting the thumbnail for the episode, my plan here was not here specifically, was also to do an NPC roundup. So, I guess we might as well start the NPC roundup with our good friend, and certainly not at all our adversary, Garank, Beast Clergyman. Oh. We can't speak with him anymore, seemingly. Okay, so he's still aggro to us. We can't look at our map or anything. But like... We also can't lock on to him. I've no doubt we can... hurt him. But I don't see why we would. I thought he would let us speak with him, so either we triggered this by advancing his quest line in, this, in the way that we did, or perhaps because we have the great rune, we've, you know, reunified the great, great rune, restored the benediction of Radon's great rune. Wow, okay. Um, I'm done with this, because, yeah, it's made us into such a glass cannon. Not sure if that's any better, but wow, okay. I really don't get it. What if we sit at the bon the bonfire, side of grace? I, friend? I won't forget. Again. My appetite. My sin. I must have more. I must consume more. 
Beast Claw. So did we err in coming here without Deathroot to give him? Maybe that's another reason why we triggered that. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, friend. <laughs> wow. That was uh, quite the experience. Incantation taught by Grank, the beast clergyman, creates beast claws that rend the land with shockwaves. Charging enhances potency. This incantation represents the fury of Grank, his bestial nature returned. As much as it does, his restless agitation I'm sorry that you're feeling agitated friend um yeah I just came here to get a picture that's that's all I wanted um, but yes I will certainly return in the very near future with some death root with your name on it don't you worry um again more sort of fossilized ruins here seemingly the bloodborne friend over there aka the vulgar friends yeah see this is what I was looking for the divine tower However, I'm not really crazy about the view here, in part because of the rain. Um, but anyways, yeah, th these are the sorts of things I usually do off camera. Um, I just so happen to start recording before warping here, and I guess it's a good thing I did, because otherwise, yeah, I would not have caught that whole thing on camera. Okay, anyways, um, yeah, I'm going to try and get a better photo of the Divine Tower for the thumbnail for the previous episode. But, uh, yeah, let's go to... So we're going to do a roundtable... A roundtable? Roundup. An NPC roundup. And as usual, I'm not going to show you my warping. I'm just going to cut to whatever the next um, NPC event is. So any events that I'm able to advance or new dialogue or whatever i'm not going to bother showing you the warping i'm just going to cut to whatever happens next so enjoy okay um it actually doesn't seem like there's all that much going on maybe i just uh you know, I didn't go speak with every single NPC. I went and I spoke with the ones whom I suspected might have something new. I actually didn't end up with anything, so here we are. Going to see the one NPC whom I suspect may actually have something to say. And that is this sorcerer friend. Oh, and I just realized. That sorcerer friend's doggo, and I killed him in the previous... Oh, that's... Okay, now I feel bad. Hence all the restraints on around its neck. I should have realized. Like, granted, you can still lock onto them. But yeah, okay, I feel bad now. Um, yeah, because, uh... The person he's apparently trying to save... Why do you sit like that? It's very strange. <laughs> the person he's apparently trying to save uh, invaded us in the previous episode, right at the end. So I figured we might as well check with him to see if he has anything new to say about that. First, you must find the unalloyed gold needle. It's hidden on okay. a secret. Okay, so nothing new. I was uh, using that as an opportunity to take a drink of coffee. <laughs> And uh, he did not get the message. So, I'm wondering how... 
because there's clearly stuff up here. In the Celia Gateway, but I assume we have to reach there from the side here. So we basically have to walk around. I think we more or less finished exploring the southern part of the swamp there. Let's see if this friend will aggro to us. Oh. I'm friends with your master. I'm friends with... No, gosh darn it. Master. I shouldn't use that term. Um... Because, you know, from an animal's perspective, I don't think they see humans, domestic domesticated animals, I should say. I don't think they see humans as their masters as much as they see humans as being sort of the pets. <laughs> they see it in the opposite way that humans do. So, you know, who am I to suggest that... Whoa! Okay. Okay. that the animals are the ones who see it the wrong way. And then it's not us. And I, re I realized that um, throughout this playthrough I've talked a lot about humans and animals and how they interact with one another and my views on whether or not and, and more accurately my belief that humans do not have some sort of special privilege over animals and that we should be treating them with respect. There is actually a theoretical basis for that perspective. Which, um, yeah, I, I will talk about it at some point during this playthrough. Um, if you're interested in, I guess, reading ahead, so to speak, the theoretical basis I'm talking about is... Karen Barad's agential realism. Basically, the idea that uh, Karen Barad explores the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics, of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And one of those implications is that humans don't exist apart from everything else, but that humans exist with everything else. We're not apart from anything. We are thoroughly imbalanced, a dreadful form of combat, that. <laughs> yeah, we don't exist apart from anything. We are thoroughly embedded in and inseparable from everything else. Things that we do... Oh, is this that boss that we came across earlier? Might be. Yeah, I think it is. That humans... We are... Things we do affect other things and vice versa. And quantum mechanics is sort of the, the purest and most microscopic illustration of that, I suppose. Such that, you know, it, it doesn't really make any sense to talk about interacting with things, but rather humans intra-act with things. So that is inter being between two things that are separate, separate entities. And uh, intra referring to, referring to things that are actually one and the same. That was dreadful. Okay, Commander O'Neill. Okay, so this is not going to end well for us, I don't think. But anyways, yeah, that's... <laughs> I'll talk about it in greater depth and, and give a bit more of a explanatory overview of why it matters and why I find it compelling. Okay, I uh, guess I was out of stamina there. I was not fully paying attention. Oh my gosh, come on.
Didn't realize there was a summon sign there. Till it was much too late. Commander Standard. Unalloyed Gold Needle. Okay, so we got the Gold Needle we needed. That's fortuitous. Thank you, uh, Latena, for your assistance. Heart of Ionia. An intricately crafted needle of unalloyed gold snapped in half. A ritual implement crafted to ward away the meddling of outer gods. It is thought capable of forestalling the incurable rotting sickness. Sage Gowrie has designs for this needle. A beaten red battle standard is furled around this time-worn halberd. Even after his lord was fled, Commander O'Neill continued to brandish this flag in the devastation of the rot-eaten field of battle, the sole veteran who remembers this battle with pride. Unique skill, rallying standard. Hoist the banner, hoist the war banner aloft and give a rallying command. Raises attack power and defense for self and nearby allies. So yeah, uh, banner affixed to a halberd essentially is pretty cool. What is going on here? All this splashing. Yeah, not a tremendously pleasant place, this Ionia. It's a good thing we stumbled back into this, because, uh, yeah, otherwise I was just going to proceed. Alright, so it's now 6.30 in the morning on Friday the 7th of April, 2023. I hope you're all still having a fantastic day. It is a statutory holiday today, which means I have the day off. And I figured before we got started with the episode proper, we ended off the previous recording session talking about Karen Barad's theory of responsibility, or rather of agential realism, which leads to the notion of responsibility. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but yeah, I thought I might as well go through some slides that I prepared as part of my postdoctoral research to just sort of give you a better idea, just in case my uh, spiel in the previous recording session was not really all that clear. Um, I've not yet edited that recording session yet, so I'm actually not sure. Maybe it was perfectly clear and this is totally unnecessary, but I did promise that I would talk about it in greater detail. So here we are. Um, so again, the context for for this slide deck is I put it together for my uh, as part of my postdoctoral fellowship and uh, for those who are not aware I did a postdoctoral fellowship at an engineering school even though of course I'm not an engineer but I was brought in to essentially do equity oriented engineering education research how can you take the culture of engineering which is very which has historically been very focused on white cis men and how can you make engineering a little bit more diverse. And so I put together this presentation as a way of trying to convince the higher ups, I guess, that a more radical approach was needed to sort of reform the culture of the school. In order to make engineering more diverse, you needed to actually uh, affect a serious and fundamental change in the culture and how engineering education understands itself in relation to the world and how engineers understand themselves in relation to the world. And so that led to this presentation um, in which I essentially argued that, um, and you know, I'm skipping basically to the end of the presentation to the implications part of it, but to generate equitable outcomes, I argued a STEM education research framework must conceive of social and environmental justice as an essential component of STEM practice and not as an optional, not as optional content that's grafted onto existing curricula to incentivize marginalized students to pursue STEM careers, which is essentially what it is right now um, and uh, what it continues to be because I unfortunately was not successful in convincing the higher ups that something radically different needed to be done. This framework must also be consistent with indigenous understandings of material agency, relational accountability, and ethical relationality. 
and it must be responsive to and committed to foregrounding through participatory methods, marginalized students' perspectives on STEM. And finally, it must be reasonably comprehensible to engineers and scientists with minimal training in the social sciences, because of course they're going to be the ones who are sort of implementing these findings, and yeah, so it has to be reasonably comprehensible to them as well. And so in other words, it needs to be asset-based, it needs to be based on critical theory or inform a critical theory, and it needs to be anti-deficit. And so my uh, proposal essentially was that I wanted to challenge deficit-oriented approaches with critical asset-based participatory STEM education research informed by third-wave science and technology studies. And there was essentially one research program that or one area of research that was emerging in this area uh, around the time when I was doing my postdoctoral research. And uh, so essentially I decided I needed to build my postdoctoral research program on Shaknoza Kayamova's shift from a proposed shift from empowerment to responsibility in STEM education research. Kayamova is the founder of the STEAM Language Learning and Identity Research Lab at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, where she serves as Associate Professor of STEM Education and Teacher Development. And so the concept of responsibility, so not responsibility, but responsibility, is not new. What is novel about the proposed shift from empowerment to responsibility is Kayamova's application of the idea and her attentiveness to the theoretical insights of STS, or Science and Technology Studies. Some researchers have already answered Kayamova's call, but this remains an emerging area of STEM education research. Critical responsibility is less about teaching how to be responsible or empowered individuals towards nature. It is more about fostering relational accountability and opening up possibilities for rendering one another capable in responsiveness, learning, being or becoming, and participating in world making as human and more than human collectives. This understanding of critical responsibility is firmly rooted in Karen Barad's theory of agential realism and her associated ethico-onto-epistemology. Don't worry, we'll explain that in plainer language in just a minute. Barad developed her ethico-onto-epistemology by bringing Foucauldian understandings of discourse to bear on Niels Bohr's interpretation of quantum physics. This point is best illustrated with reference to the double-slit experiment. Here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now. If we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, 
a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. Okay, so <laughs> there is obviously a lot to unpack there and we'll get to that in just a second. Just wanted to point out that this um, excerpt came from a documentary called What the Bleep Do We Know? And it's funny because <laughs> I think the documentary, this documentary as a whole is, you know, uh, perhaps being a bit uncharitable here, but it's kind of rubbish. Um, <laughs> but in spite of that, it actually has this clip, I think it represents one of the best possible explanations that, that I've found anyway, plain language explanations for why this bit of quantum weirdness is so significant and why it deserves to sort of be explored in greater detail. Um, and yeah, so that's why I have included it here because it seemed like the most straightforward way of explaining the significance of this particular experiment and why it's significant to how it turned out. So to make sense of wave particle duality, quantum physics researchers turn to observation. The mere act of observing this experiment, however, collapsed the wave function. The double set experiment renders visible the fundamental flaw with classical physics. That is the presumed distinction between objects on the one hand and agencies of observation on the other. Observers exist within and not apart from their experiments. In other words, the view from nowhere, as Donna Haraway puts it, is little more than a god trick. So turning now to Barad's ethical onto-epistemology. So ontological, the ontological aspect of this theory is, and so ontological by that we mean the nature of reality. Humans exist within and not apart from nature. Together, humans and non-humans form a non-dualistic collective which generates phenomena relationally. So things don't happen in isolation from other things. Things are always happening because of the relationships between things. The epistemological aspect of the theory, so that is the aspect of the theory which relates to the nature of knowledge, Objective knowledge is generated with reference to phenomena, not observation-independent objects. And the ethical component of it, so that is concerning the nature of morality, 
we have an ethical obligation or a responsibility to human and non-human others. So this is Karen Barad's ethico-onto-epistemology. So it's the ontological, epistemological, and ethical implications of the double-slit experiment. And so there are material discursive consequences of this shift that has been proposed from empowerment to responsibility. And again, the context for this is... Um, STEM education research and equity-oriented STEM education research, but uh, I provide a few examples here. So Fisher's, and this is an example from my doctoral research, Fisher's interact with sockeye salmon, but under, so that's, that's the empowerment angle, but if you were to talk about it through the lens of responsibility, you would talk about humans intra-acting with sockeye salmon. So in other words, you don't talk about things interacting as though they are separate parts of a whole, or no, as, as though they are completely separable, separable agencies. Uh, you talk about them intra-acting because they're acting within something. They're not acting between something. So humans exist with sockeye salmon. You would, under the empowerment lens, if you were doing uh, research if you're doing research involving marginalized students, you would be collecting data from or extracting data from marginalized students. But under the responsibility framework, you are generating data with marginalized students. Because again, the you're generating data because you're not just you're not simply collecting it from someone. It doesn't just exist and then you take it from them. You generate data together through your interactions, your intra-actions, I should say, with one another. And this data is generated relationally through the the research relationship. You would speak under empowerment of empowering marginalized students to endure and overcome systemic discrimination in STEM education contexts. But under responsibility, you would talk more accurately about working with marginalized students to understand and confront systemic discrimination in STEM education contexts. And engineers may consider or ignore the impact of their work on humans, non-humans, and the environment. In other words, this was the status quo when I entered my postdoctoral, and it, I think it's still the status quo today, but um, this was my assessment of the status quo, that, that they can consider these things, and you know, if they consider these things, then they can, uh, <laughs> by merely considering them, give themselves awards and, you know, talk about how great the things they're doing are, and, and you know, how... Uh, socially responsible they are as engineers and how they're fulfilling the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, even though that absolutely is meaningless and doesn't accomplish anything. <laughs> um, can you tell I'm still kind of bitter about, <laughs> about my postdoctoral research? Um, but, you know, engineers may consider or ignore the impact of their work on humans, non-humans, and the environment. And that's essentially the status quo under the empowerment lens. Under the responsibility lens, you would say that engineers have a responsibility to consider how their work impacts humans and non-human collectives and environments. And so that's essentially it. Um, I'm probably not going to take you through the rest of this, but you know, you can pause the video if you're interested in reading the rest. Um, and I suppose I could leave a link in the video description below to a uh, an article that I wrote or a conference paper that I wrote, um, which sort of, yeah, this first one here, uh, work integrated learning and physics, marginalized students perspectives on STEM. Com oh, okay. Well, the title of the paper completely changed, but anyways, that's, that's essentially my, um, postdoctoral research in a nutshell right there. Yeah. And you know what? <laughs> Um, I think I screwed up. I think I'm, what I meant to actually show you all is a different presentation, which is this one here. <laughs> oh, gosh darn it. But I've just spent 20 minutes of the recording session already recording the other one. So I think what I'll probably do is just, because this one, yeah, I think does a much better job of explaining some of the issues. It didn't include that video, but essentially, um, yeah, I think it does a better job of explaining some of the nuances involved. Um, like how the idea of responsibility is based on Karen Broad's theory of agential realism. 
and as gentle realism situates scientists and engineers in the world, obliges them to consider the ethical implications of this embeddedness, and challenges them to generate knowledges with, rather than conducting research on, or extracting data from others. So that's essentially summing up a few of the slides from the previous presentation, but... Uh, I also go on to state that scientists and engineers exist within the world and not apart from it. And that scientists and engineers do not interact with the world, they intra-act within it. Um, I presented this at a conference to a bunch of engineers and yeah, I, you know, I think to some degree I, they weren't ready for it and to some degree I didn't do a good enough job of explaining it because there were a lot of blank stares in the crowd <laughs> as I was presenting this, but... And the proposed shift from empowerment to responsibility is about more than simply acknowledging that STEM exists within the world. It's about bolstering our collective ability to respond to that acknowledgement. In other words, our responsibility. So again, I think this slide does a lot, a much better job of actually explaining this point than the previous slide deck did. Um... But yeah, uh, I won't go through the whole thing here. I have several, again, I was trying very hard to ensure that the things I was explaining were understood and that, uh, you know, <laughs> went out of my way to make sure that the engineers were understanding the things I was talking about. But, you know, in the end, I don't think, you know, I think to some degree, maybe I got a bit too technical and, you know, uh, to some degree, I think, they weren't quite quite ready for it because really they they seem perfectly happy to just continue on with their way of doing things which was you know they acknowledge that uh stem exists within the world but they don't actually do anything they don't respond adequately to that acknowledgement so as a result of that it just ended up like they do all of this work where they're saying, oh yeah, you know, uh, we did this research and all of these students said that they're more interested now in exploring careers in STEM. Um, but uh, that's all it was. And yeah, you can see here the, <laughs> I took specific aim at the idea of the sustainable development goals because they, yeah, they're rubbish, but, and don't actually demonstrate anything. But yeah, anyways, this is, uh, I'm like dredging up the past year and a half, almost two years of my work, and it's uh, doing weird things to me. So I'm going to end it there. So having said all of that, um, I wanted to bring it back to the ancestral followers. And so you might look at these, I was going to call them helmets, but headpieces, and say, well, isn't that kind of, you know, I'm suggesting essentially that the ancestral followers are following a similar sort of approach in that they see themselves as being part of the part of the landscape, part of the world in the same way that indigenous peoples in North America look at themselves in relation to particular kinds of what we might call quote unquote wildlife. In Coast Salish territory, so in uh, what is now known as British Columbia on the Pacific coast, there are many First Nations who see themselves as kin to sockeye salmon, such that they have ceremonies, uh, the first salmon to return of the year, uh, for salmon that is caught, they do a first salmon ceremony, where in keeping with a pact that they made with a salmon god, they return the bones from the first salmon they catch and that they, they eat and share amongst everyone. They return the bones to the river. And so the idea is that you're taking only what you need and you're putting everything back, that you are, you are making absolute use of everything. You're not just catching stuff and then trying to sell it and, and you're trying to maximize your profit uh, without considering the impact of your actions. 
So in other words, in order to be a responsible person, so response-able person, you are not just acknowledging, you're not just acknowledging that you exist in the world, but you are responding to that acknowledgement. You are allowing your your actions to actually reflect that acknowledgement. Instead of just thinking, oh yeah, you know, I exist in the world, we exist in the world, so yeah, maybe we'll plant some trees to make up for all the, you know, carbon we're emitting or something silly like that, like, you know, UN Sustainable Development Goal level stuff. Um, and so, in other words, in order to be a responsible person um, who acknowledges that, that they exist in the world, they don't exist apart from it, and that uh, responds to that acknowledgement, you don't necessarily need to be a vegetarian or a vegan. Um, you can, much like the ancestral followers seemingly, you can still hunt wildlife, but what matters is sort of the respect that you show to the wildlife. What matters is that you know, you're know you not positioning wildlife as somehow being subservient to you and your needs. Um, that you show reverence for and, and that you're grateful, you show respect to the wildlife such that you're not just wiping them all out for profit and for nothing else. You're taking what you need, but you're also respecting, and, and that respect has the side effect, of course, of ensuring that the ecosystem uh, continues to flourish. So yeah, that's the, the basic idea behind that. And, um, you know... <laughs> It's been, I don't know, 40 minutes of recording already, and we've not even moved from where we fought Commander O'Neill. Commander. Commander O'Neill in uh, the, I was going to say the previous episode, the previous recording session, which was about a week ago at this point. So um, I do need to get my bearings here. I do love how, obviously, we got that, the Sight of Grace behind us from defeating Commander O'Neill, but there's another Sight of Grace literally right here. Um, I want to say that we've explored everything here, but I said that last time and then we stumbled across Commander O'Neill, so I'm not sure really to what extent we have explored everything. It looks almost like we can scale these roots. <laughs> Not the most compelling form of battle, but... Oh, Clean Rock Reeves. So is that supposed to be a fixed drop, or did we just get lucky there? Greaves of the Clean Rot Knights, celebrated for their undefeated campaign in the Shattering. The Clean Rot Knights vowed to fight alongside Millennia, despite the inevitable, if gradual, putrefaction of their flesh. Their acceptance of their fate made these battles the fiercest of all. Well, how did. <laughs> how did I end up doing that? Um... Yeah. So, yeah, I'm still not sure that I understand, because my assumption, anyway, was that the Clean Rot Knights... <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know how I'm losing my voice already. My assumption was that the Clean Rot Knights were... Radon's Knights. And that they were sent here to deal with the rot. As the name suggests, clean the rot. So burn it away. Um, but what I'm getting from all of, from the fact that Millennia is the leader of the Clean Rot Knights is that it's more complicated than that. Um, because the way that Sir Gideon off near the all-knowing, quote-unquote, the way that he framed it, he framed it as though the rot was Millennia's rot. Uh, 
Ah, that was weird. Ooh. Okay. So you friends really are from the Ring City, aren't you? Are they, they supposed to be, like, completely ineffectual? More ineffective, I should say. Because, yeah, they really do seem to struggle with basic combat against someone who's not moving on horseback. I'm reasonably certain we've been here. Street of Sages Ruins. I believe we have. Um... My apologies, I know. This must be frustrating for those of you who are watching this later because, of course, you've already seen me go through all of this. Oh my goodness, okay. I have zero control on horseback in this. Um, this will verify. Yes. <laughs> the chest is has been looted so yeah we've done all this okay so what we need to do now is actually go back to sorcerer friend i think that's why i marked that with a beacon we need to go back to sorcerer friend at beacon one and give him the gold needle um oh yeah so obviously the sorcerer friend that was the impetus for me talking about responsibility and karen broad's theory of agential realism Oh, wow. Oh, that was the R2 attack. That's why they shot up into the air. I was wondering about that. Yeah, so that was the impetus for us because this friend is just sort of... Oh, that's a blood stain. Okay. That's a pretty cool attack. Because the doggo friend there. Uh... Okay, now I remember what we were doing. We were thinking about how we could get on top of the silly gateway. And then we dealt with, we wanted to deal with a uh, giant friend over there as well. Okay, so it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> My apologies. Um... But yeah, I'm thinking we might have to access it from the west as opposed to the east. I was thinking that the east is where we needed to be. But yeah, this doggo friend here was the impetus for me because, you know, the doggo is wearing what looked initially to me like they were sort of wearing a bear trap or something. Like they had been caught in a bear trap. But as best as I can tell, I think the implication is supposed to be that Sorcerer friend here. Someone's still aggro to me. The sorcerer friend here um, has taken, yeah, Gowry has taken this doggo as their pet. His pet, I should say. Hello, I have a golden needle for you. Oh, you found the unalloyed gold needle. As promised, I've detailed the secret of Celia right here. Go on. It's yours. Celia's secret. Now let me have a look at the needle. Hmm. Hmm. Well, well, this is a marvel indeed. The work of a true artisan, a meticulous, bold craftsman who grasps the essence of life. Can you give me some time with this? As well made as it is, it won't be much use snapped in half, will it? Alrighty then. Can you give me as well made? Okie dokes. So what then is Celia's secret? Note given by Sage Gowry, detailing the secret he promised. The town of Celia hides the source. Light three flames atop the candle towers to break the seal. 
so I assume by the source they're referring to millennia. Um, perhaps we should save quit so that he has more quote-unquote time with his needle. I have awaited your return. The needle is repaired. Now it will forestall the rotting sickness, I'm sure. Will you give it to the girl, Millicent? I will reward you in kind. An allied gold needle. Millicent rests at the church atop the cliff beyond Celia, the town yonder. Tended to by the witless pests who worship her, or rather her rotting sickness, as a god. A wretched fate, indeed. The poor girl, she never wished for any of this. Do you find it peculiar that I would show such concern for the girl? Well, I'm the one that found her. A mere babe in the swamp of Aeonia. She is... One of my dear daughters. But the rotting sickness erodes one's memory. I doubt that she remembers the first thing about me. Oh, I must be getting old. I didn't always worry so much. <laughs> <laughs> I get the sense that he's not telling us the full truth. Now, all you need do is deliver the needle to Millicent. She's convalescing in the church atop the cliff just beyond Celia. Do so, and you shall receive a handsome recompense, of course. Now she's convalescing in... Okay, will do, friend. Church atop the cliff. I assume he's talking about this right here. Hmm. Where is he? Yeah, I'm not sure. What is this though? Gosh, it's even creepier here when it's not, when the sky isn't red. Because it's just this sort of fog. Oh, gosh darn it, stop. Oh, okay. I think we've already, already looted that one. Okay, so... See what looks like. Is that another scarab? It is. I should overwhelm the choice again. Behold up. Indeed. We should be. I think in order to get up there, we need to from the west, but where? But it's just the swamp there. So yeah, so maybe we'll just explore Celia. He did say that we would find the church beyond Celia, I believe. Yeah, so we might as well just start exploring the town. Okay, that's a uh, stick of Marika, which suggests that there could potentially be a boss fight here. Summon Latena. Oh, of course, 
course there are ghost sorcerers here. Get wrecked. <laughs> Um, hmm. So, Selen has to be from here, right? Given her name? And if so, I wonder if we'll finally get closer to solving the mystery of the, you know, multiple Selens. Like, why are there two Selens? Because I was relatively certain that that was... What the heck? One of those, uh, Avionette friends. Okay, so we're still <clears throat> technically in the open world. Because, uh, otherwise we would not have just received a refill of our Cerulean Tears. Sorry, friends. Yeah, I was relatively certain that... She was one of what's his face's dolls. Oh, new painting. Okay, interesting. Gosh, leave me alone, friend. I thought I heard an avionette somewhere. Friends, I have to look at the painting. Just give me, give me a second, please. My goodness. Work of a wandering artist, reminiscence of a painting titled Red Main. This painter is said to have captured the landscape scene during the last moments of those welcomed into death's embrace. The soul of the painter and vestiges of the dead's last moments can be discovered by visiting the location depicted even now. Oh gosh darn it, friend. So that has to be here. Pretty sure, just based on the especially the title Red Main. So it's that like field of ash. Gosh darn it, the camera is doing all sorts of wonky things. This has to be the field of ash. But not looking at Red Main Castle. Because that's not Redmain Castle. That could be... The Bestial Sanctum, though. So it might be here, looking here. So we'll have to... Have a look and see if we can't figure that out after... We've sort of cleared this area. Okay, there's a portal or a gate item up there. Yeah, it's interesting because this is structured very much like a legacy dungeon. Or at least it appears to be on the outside anyways. Looks like there's another gate up there. Have we... we have sat at that site of grace. I'm wondering though, where the heck this scarab is? <laughs> My goodness for the range of that of the uh, Ultra Great Sword, it's quite, quite something. And just thank goodness for the Ultra Great Sword in general. Absolutely tremendous weapon. Some people in the comments have been expressing their annoyance and frustration with how overleveled I am, <laughs> but. They are at, obviously, a much earlier point in the playthrough. Um, I think this weekend, episode 22 is being released? 23, maybe? Um, 
I was at that point certainly not level 106. I was maybe level 80 or something. And so those people are going to be even more upset <laughs> as time goes on because so one person says something. I can't believe you ruined a perfectly good blind playthrough by over by farming and over leveling. I can't believe it. And I was like, well, sure. They don't know that it has been ruined <laughs> personally because um, I'm still very much enjoying myself. Um, and so it is interesting, and, you know, I've talked about this, you, you just cannot please everyone, no matter what. Uh, someone's always going to be frustrated, or someone's always going to believe that you should have done something different, or, or that you ought to have found this thing, you ought, ought to have not missed this quest line, or this item, or whatever. But yeah, I find it particularly interesting, the idea that, like, the playthrough is ruined because I did some farming. And yeah, granted, I did a lot of farming. Um, it's either this person or someone else who also expressed that they were confused that I complained about not having a lot of time to play the game. Poison Grease, very nice. And yet, I spent all this time farming. And so, in case I didn't explain it, I should perhaps trying to explain that, and that is, which I'm reasonably certain that I did, but essentially if I'm up in the morning and I start work at nine and, you know, I'm ready for work, but, you know, for obvious reasons, because it's work, I don't feel like starting work yet, and I have 20 minutes or 15 minutes to kill, um, and I can, you know, fire up Elden Ring and do some farming, sure, I'll do that. Um, in the vast majority of cases, I don't also, that didn't, that means I don't also necessarily have the energy to record commentary. Um, because, and so now that I'm saying it again, I'm pretty sure I did actually discuss this. But anyway, so I guess I'll repeat myself um, by just simply stating that... How are we supposed to even open this? This looks like a very... So I guess this is the town seal. It looks different than the seal that we saw for Rai Lucaria. Which is difficult to see on some of these. They all seem to have different seals on them, but, but in any case, yes, I don't always have, the, you know, sometimes I'll have 10 or 15 minutes to spare and I'll use that time for farming. Whereas in other instances, I have time and I do have the energy to record. That's when I will record. And so when, I, when I'm complaining about not having time to play, I mean, I have time to, perhaps I should be more specific then and say, I wish I had more time to play the game when I'm able to record. Because I, you know, because of the way the playthrough is structured and everything, I can't play the game unless I'm recording because I can't advance to new areas or anything like that uh, the way in which I can I'm able to play the game is severely limited severely strictly limited I should say by the sort of terms of the blind play th blind playthrough as you know granted I'm the one who set the terms um but yeah anyways not sure why I'm justifying having farmed, but that's, I guess, my justification. <laughs> yeah, it is a funny thing, the idea that a playthrough can be ruined by someone wanting to play it the way that they want to play it. And that someone would feel compelled to leave a comment to that effect instead of just not watching it, but oh, you are not a ghost. It's basically old yeller inflicted with rabies. <laughs> Okie dokes. So we have quite a few. I wonder... 
if Gowrie will... The recompense that he mentioned, I wonder if he will open up all of the different gates in the town that are currently shut. Okie dokes. Because yeah, at the moment doesn't it really doesn't seem like there's a lot going on here. So we might as well just continue clearing it out, but I've become a bit turned around. I'm not 100% sure what we've done and what we haven't, but we continually are coming up against new ghost friends. So unless they're continually spawning aristocrat boots. Which I don't think they are. Um, although, yeah, we've definitely been here. Poor Latena. <laughs> we summoned her in what I thought was a good place, but apparently not. Okay. Rare item up there. We may in fact have to jump up there from above, though. Or do we? Nine. Looks like we're just fine. See a minor, minor ur tree there. Cerulean Tear Scarab. Blue Scarab worn directly on the head. These scarab, scarabs roll clumps of Cerulean Tears during their labors. Slightly increases the recovery effects of the Flask of Cerulean Tears, but increases damage taken. What else did we pick up? We picked up leggings. Aristocrat boots. Boots made from tanned leather. Travel attire worn by nobles in the capital. Abandoning their birthplace after the shattering, these undead wanderers are the pitiful product of unending life. Okay, where to from here? It's a good thing I... Uh, <laughs> made note that this was not a legacy dungeon otherwise I might not have thought to use torrent to climb up here all oh, right okay so we need to write light three flames so that's one seals oh, okay each one okay yeah this was very clearly telegraphed to us so I should have um I should have figured out that that's what was going on here. And that the seals weren't going to be broken as recompense. Oh, okay. Second one is right there. And third one is there. Oh, there was a rare item there as well. Oops. Yeah, we'll grab that afterwards, maybe. And that scarab, which we can also access. Okay. This uh, is a very cool town. I feel like it would have been. It would have been a lot going on here. <laughs> Uh, pre brought Scarlet Rot, so it's a shame. Okay, perhaps we'll get that Scarab first, and then we'll come back for the third tower.
Oh, gosh darn it. What a troll. Ash of War double slash. Double slash, skill of superior swordsman. Perform a crossing slash attack from a low stance. Repeated inputs allow for up to two follow-up attacks. So, in other words, um, lore the lore implications of that is that even though this is a town of sorcery, there was someone here who... Oh, that's just a common item. Oh, it's, it's just a marionette friend. Um, so even though this is a town of sorcery, there was someone here at least who was a swords person skilled with the double slash. Poison bloom. Oh, the other item we picked up was poison grease, I think. Mixture of poison green materials, so yeah. Not much new there, but I see another item there. And ooh, yeah, so this seal is broken, revealing a chest. Night Comet. One of the night sorceries of Selly, a town of sorcery, fires a semi-invisible magic comet. This sorcery can be cast repeatedly and while in motion. Char charging enhances potency. The Selian sorcerers were assassins, and it, it is said that they often hunted their fellows. Sound like delightful people. This is the second seal that was broken. Spell Drake Talisman plus one. Talisman depicting a duo of blue ancient dragons. The ancient dragons who ruled in the prehistoric era before the Ur Tree would prote protect their lord as a wall of living rock. Okay, yeah, so same description. Uh, slightly different illustration this time, though. It is interesting to me that... Whereas in the previous Souls games... So that's going to be the final. And so once we unlock the third one, presumably that's the seal that will be broken. Um, whereas in previous Souls games, there really was no visual distinction, at least not that I can recall, between the base level rings and plus one, plus two rings. So it's a really interesting change. Oh, okay, I was like, what is this shining over there? And that's just the flame that we lit. So, the last flame is here. Thank you, Torrent. Couldn't have done it without you. Broken in town and there, or I guess we'll see. I want to make sure that there isn't any additional seals that we're missing, because I feel like there might have been three. Because it says it was broken in town somewhere, and then there's also that massive seal that was right there. This is not going to be worth it, I don't think. Staff of Loss, okay. Staff missing its glintstone, wielded by sorcerers who believe that discovery comes through acts of asceticism. This staff only distinguishes itself by when casting invisibility sorceries, but that is reason enough for some to wield it. It's time for fun with definitions. Asceticism as a noun refers to severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. So, in other words, they were basically 
discovery comes through acts of asceticism so acts of avoiding indulgence so they were monks essentially or uh ascetics i guess you would say okay so we just need to make sure we're not missing any seals I think there was one back here. Indeed. It, oh. Please tell me that is what I think it is. We got it. So the night sky unceasing is the third belfry that we've yet to oh my goodness thank you finally oh okay okay that's okay wow i want to go do that now <laughs> gosh there's i've already forgotten there was something else we were going to do as well that i said we would do when we finished here but I've already forgotten now because I'm so excited about getting to see what's behind the third belfry. I hope it's better than the uh, <laughs> crumbling Furum Azula one because that was, I feel like, a complete waste. Oh, it was the painting. Going to find the painting. Okay, so we have our to-do list for the rest of the episode, I guess. Sight of Grace? Indeed. Celia Backstreets. Backstreets back. All right. <laughs> Terrible, I know. <laughs> okay. Oops. I was wondering. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Gosh darn it. I maintain that was basically a trap for the, the mechanic of them just being one shotable after that initial shot. I feel like that's a trap for returning players. I say returning players as though this is the second game in the series, which it obviously isn't. Nice hat, friend. However, it's one of those things that will definitely... is more likely to catch out someone who has played Dark Souls 1 in particular. Where there's a precedent for requiring some sort of external item in order to... Um, fell those, effectively fell those who may in fact be dead. Oh, gosh darn it. <laughs> and I... Speedruns in this game must be so frustrating for speedrunners. <laughs> Maybe I'm just terrible. Like, I wouldn't put that past myself, I guess. Um, because I don't know how you can control Torrent with the level of control needed. Oh! No. That was absolutely dreadful. So again, I was basically blaming Torn for that in advance, but really that was my own fault. <laughs> oh gosh darn it. Almost did it again. It's only like 20,000 runes, so really not a big deal, but... Do we want to try one more time? Let's try one more time. No, didn't make it. <laughs> I bailed halfway. Yeah, 
not going to try that again. I really want to go to that third belfry now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, the problem is I'm not seeing another way on top of that structure there. Maybe we're just not supposed to ascend to the top of it. Okay, wow, good thing we were on Torrent back there. <laughs> as much as I was just complaining about Torrent. Where did that even go? Okay, I think I can see the church where Millicent is. That's definitely the church where Millicent is. And presumably many more of those who live in death. So are these Millicent's worshippers then? Those who live in death. Presumably. friends called again we got an item which hinted at it or didn't hint at it, it told us straight up it was ashes kindred of rot they're called oh do you have to get them before they actually stand up i suppose indeed that's really annoying <laughs> These are Millicent's guards, seemingly. Oh, that was a dreadful sneak attack. <laughs> Church of the Plague. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, hold that thought for one second, friend. We need uh, to capture a screenshot here for the thumbnail. Or I usually say for the thumbnail, um, but that doesn't always end up being the case. So we need to capture a potential screenshot for the thumbnail, I should say. Okie dokes. I had a dream about Sacramental Bud yesterday. <laughs> um... I know that sounds weird. I don't have any additional information about it other than the idea of a sacramental bud was in my dream. Okay, Millicent, I'm coming. I'm sorry. I had to just catch the butterflies and pick the sacramental bud. Oh, she looks like she's in quite rough shape. Hello. Who's there? Well, it matters not. If you are wise, you will leave immediately. My flesh writhes with scarlet rot. It is a curse. Not to be meddled with by man. Well, it's a good thing I am a alien hamster butterfly. <laughs> Forgot the third part. Um, I have a gift for you. You ask that I stab myself with the needle to quell the scarlet rot. But 
How? <laughs> Never mind. I've decided I would rather trust you than simply continue to spoil from within. Would you mind averting your eyes for a moment? No, oh, I was going to do it anyway, but that works. <laughs> Well, that was easier than expected. But, but why do I feel so... Uh-oh. Did we just poison her further? Oh, crud. Okay. Let's rest. Oh. Okay, that looks like a dramatic improvement. I assume she was missing that arm previously. I hoped to see you again. My apologies for when last we met. I fainted before I could even thank you. Everything is as you said. Since inserting the needle, the scarlet rot has ceased to writhe. Even the nightmares have abated. And now, though I can scarcely believe it myself, I can move as I please. Not that I could ever truly repay you, but I would like you to have this. By way of thanks. A token though it is. Prosthesis Wearer Heirloom. I'm considering leaving on a journey with the needle buried in my flesh. I've started to recall, but dimly, my destiny. It's all thanks to you. My name is Millicent. I pray fate permits us meet again. So I'm reminded of the that trailer that I watched, the only trailer I watched before this game came out in which some friend was facing off with Radon, and they popped an arm into their socket. And I want to say it was their right arm. Now we have this item description talking about a prosthetic or a prosthesis. Prosthesis wearer heirloom. A talisman engraved with a scene from a... A talisman engraved with a scene from a heroic tale raises dexterity. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered her mentor and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. I'm considering with the needle buried my destiny. Her destiny, okay. Sacred tear. Okay, she is gone. Need five golden seeds now for the next charge. So that's going to take a while, I think. Okay, well, I guess now we have to finish exploring this area. And then we have to go check in with Gowrie. Ah, so this is indeed, are those the opera bats? They are indeed. So this is how we were supposed to get up here. So the giant friend who is tossing stuff at us is going to be up here somewhere. The frame rate is definitely not... At least when you were look when we were looking down just now, it's definitely not sixty frames per second. I don't know why I'm even bothering picking all this stuff up. Sorry, rot friend. Just want to make sure there's nothing important here. Gosh, I love holidays. <laughs> I 
There should be more. Or four day work weeks should be standard. It's ridiculous that we spend so much of our time working. When, you know, we could be playing Elden Ring, so. <laughs> Okay, I'm effectively going backwards here, so let's go this way. Oh, and some starlight shards here, presumably. Indeed. Okay, so that's Redmain Castle. Okay, so the painting may actually be up there. The painter, I should say. Um, we have what I've <laughs> continued to call throughout much of the playthrough a crow-headed hydra here. However, um, and I'll have to give this person credit by putting their comment on the screen right now. But I've been led to understand that octopuses do, in fact, have beaks. And that that's actually one of the more normal things about the quote-unquote crow-headed hydras. In spite of my insistence that it represents some sort of odd characteristic of them. Ah. Sanchium friend to lead us to... No way. You're telling me that there was a set of catacombs connected to Radon's boss room. Okay, I guess that's fair enough. Well, you have a lot of poise for a skeleton. There's no way that person survived that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You know, I suspected there might be something there, but... I was so intent on... I was so intent on uh, seeing where that comet led and uh, going to Nokron that I just sort of, yeah, moved past it. But that is something we're going to have to add to our to-do list, which is uh, <laughs> growing in length by the minute here. Like, wait, why don't we get out of the ground again? You're an interesting... Gosh darn it. Uh, I want to say that I planned that, but I definitely did not, <laughs> but I'll take it. Beast blood. Why is it always crafting materials? Spirit spring here. All right, lift me up. Oh, that's a gigantic dragon.
and a smaller dragon with very little HP. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh no. Okay. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Let's get out of here. Okay, we activated their home security system. <laughs> they really, uh, they don't know what's going on. I know this seems really convenient, but I actually have to stop this recording session now. <laughs> so, yeah, we're gonna have to come back to this in just a few minutes. <laughs> okay, so conveniently, that seems to have worked in terms of negating their aggro. Well, <laughs> I say that as though that was my intent. I did actually have to put an end to that recording session. Oh, it's, for a second I thought that was one of the giants or something. Get wrecked. Oh gosh darn it. So yeah. <laughs> It obviously wasn't my intent to save quit to negate their aggro. However, it did work. So there is that. So there's bound to be a ghost somewhere here, I think. Would you need to find that painting? These, those who live in death friends are going to be a nuisance, I think. Well, I guess they already are being a nuisance, but... <laughs> this friend came from quite a distance. Could hear his little feet just flip flop flip flop flip flop <laughs> so lonely indeed boss oh boss oh so does that mean if you come here before the boss fight you can see Bradon yeah so he would be he was right here on this hill I think so I think that's where the site of, yeah, that's exactly where the site, oh, the site of grace is a little bit to the right. But yeah, more or less in that direction. So yeah, so that person was referring, so lonely referring to General Bredon. So that's, yeah. Yeah, I'm still not entirely clear on what happened to him and how he ended, like, you know, other than the things we were explicitly told. Which may or may not be the complete story. Yeah, not doing that. Okay, so where? is the painter friend. So that is Redmain Castle, I think, in the distance. I 
I was thinking because of the ruins in the picture, but it has to be from down there. So yeah, I, I guess when we go to deal with that catacombs, whenever catacombs are down there, um, that's when we will look for the painting friend. Yeah, cause, hmm. It would have to be there, right? Just beneath us? The angle isn't quite right. Oh, it's, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's there. Yeah, that's exactly where it is. Thereabouts. Yeah, that's close enough. Okay, so we'll have to check that out. Uh, after we... What else do we have to do? We have to go speak to Gowrie. Trying to... <laughs> just should have written this down. Uh, in between the previous recording session and this one. It's only about an hour and a half, two hours later, something like that. Um, but essentially... It's just a candle there now. Essentially, it's only been a couple hours, but <laughs> during that period, I was like, maybe I should write down all the things I need to do. And then I just didn't end up actually having time to do that. Um, in that, yeah, I could have done that, but... That's uh, time I otherwise could have spent recording. Okay, so now I do remember the first thing I wanted to do, which was to go down here. Um, this is where all the opera bats are. And so we will go back and deal with those dragons later. That's Celia down there. Someone in the comments of an earlier episode explained that the dragons, or sorry, the dragons, that the opera bats are essentially they're singing in Latin, which I suppose shouldn't surprise me, because from soft games, I, I want to say one of the bosses in Bloodborne. Is it a boss? It was something in Bloodborne where there was Latin text, or um, they were singing in Latin, I think, or saying something in Latin. Oh, sorry, opera friends. Now, there is the giant who was, oh gosh darn it. So no wonder we found the poi, oh gosh darn it. We found the poison stuff here because of, yeah, the opera bats, of course, inflict poison. Oh my goodness. Please just leave me be. I know I did come to your home. But we can coexist. You sing, I just walk on by. That's that could be our deal. <laughs> Golden rune level nine. Wow. Well, certainly they know how to tempt me, because <laughs> you all know how I am with consumable souls. These are demi-human friends. Okay. Bunch of jars as well. I wonder what's on the other side there. Looks like it's just a tower. And then there's gallery. Okay. Why is everything on fire here? Oh, 
we want to just leave the giant friend? I feel like it wouldn't actually make a difference. Because I don't imagine he's a single spawn anyway. So killing him up here won't really make a difference when we're down there. So might as well just leave him. Just make sure there's nothing on top of this pile of stuff. Didn't expect I spawned. Research, oh research. Indeed, yeah, nothing up here. Okay. Come on, Torrent. <laughs> Time for revenge. I, I had an inkling that that message would at least one of the messages would reference revenge. <laughs> Which I think is fair, but yeah, we're just gonna leave them. Same with the demi-human friends. Oh, corpse ahead pointing at the skull, presumably? This thing? Yeah. Okie dokie. Thank you, iframes. Black Keybolt. If we've had that yet. Bolt used in Crepus's Black Key Crossbow, an assassin's tool of exquisite craftsmanship. The intricate spiral tip bores deep, injecting scarlet rot far into the flesh of its target. And that does not sound pleasant. Okie dokie. I'm actually drinking water today instead of coffee. <laughs> um, although, the reason for that is... Some normal goat friends. They're not mutated, so that's interesting. Um, the reason for that is simply that, uh, I wanted to maximize my recording time. So I wanted to make a coffee, but I was like, oh, it's like three minutes that I could otherwise be recording. Because I would like to wrap up this episode today. Um, in the hopes that, yeah, I'm hoping to just continually stockpile episodes as much as possible so that, um... It may become possible at some point to release more than one episode per week, and that's what I'm aiming for. But also because at some point in the summer, so late June, early July most likely, I'm going to be visiting my in-laws with my wife and Aurelia of Astora in British Columbia. So we'll be taking a couple of weeks off away from home and thus my ps5 so obviously won't be able to record during that time so you know on the one hand it would be nice to be able to oh here's another one of those boreal goat friends why this friend i likened to irithelian Irith knights in from dark souls 3 Swamp Lookout Tower. Eternal Darkness. Forbidden Sorcery of Celia, Town of Sorcery, creates a space of darkness that draws in sorceries and incantations. This sorcery can be cast while in motion. Originally a lost sorcery of the Eternal City, the despair that brought about its ruin made manifest. The despair that brought about its ruin made manifest. So, it's like a black hole. The despair in a black hole. Yeah, 
Not sure what that's supposed to mean. Um, don't know that there's any despair in a like in an astronomical sense in a black hole. It's just a black hole. Um, and despite popular sort of depictions of what a black hole is and what you know its characteristics, it doesn't. It's not like an all-consuming thing that like sucks everything as it goes. Like it, it's not quite that simple or sort of how it's depicted my understanding of it anyway of course I'm not an astronomer um but yeah anyways uh something for us to file upstairs quote unquote and uh consider whether we might reconsider some aspect of that element of the story later so yeah, might as well just hop down on the graves here. I guess we could have hopped down there as well. So that would have been one reason to take out Giant Friend. But, I th you know, I think we're okay to not do that. Where are we? We'll, however, take out Mosquito Friends. <laughs> or Dragonfly Friends. It is just as I was saying earlier in the playthrough that you know it's all well and good to argue that we interact with things and that um, we exist as one with the rest of the world and and you know you shouldn't treat other things poorly or anything else like that Ooh, torrent Ooh. <laughs> but at the same time you know, there are certain animals who just sort of escape our sympathies. And for me, yeah, I guess two of them would be uh, rodents and certain insects, um, including cockroaches and uh, mosquitoes. Ooh. Okay, so she said she was going to go on a journey. Her destiny awaited her. And Gowrie is no longer here. Oh, hello again. Something about this place felt familiar to me, so I decided to pay a visit, hoping to find someone here, but I've only found emptiness. Perhaps before my departure, I needed someone to say farewell to. So she has yellow eyes. And some sort of white patch on her right cheek. Well, never mind that. I must focus on my journey. For which I have you to thank. I must stay strong. Well, I must f I must. So what happened to Gowry? Why is it always Sage? Okay, save quit, I guess, then? <laughs> okay. A little switcheroo. Thank you kindly for giving the needle to Millicent. Now she, too, can begin her journey and stare her fate straight in the eye. You've been a saint through and through. As thanks, I vow to impart to you my knowledge of the lost sorceries of the Salians, descendants of the Eternal. Okay, that's not really what I was hoping for, but sure. <laughs> Glintstone Stars. One of the Glintstone sorceries of the Academy of Raya Lucaria fires three magic shooting stars that pursue this, the target. This sorcery can be cast while in motion. Charging enhances potency. A sorcery of the Alivnius Conspectus, which attracts sorcerers from Celia, town of sorcery. Um, this one is one of the night sorceries of Celia, town of sorcery. Swiftly fires a semi-invisible projectile. This sorcery can be used without delay after performing another action. 
The Selian sorcerers were assassins, and it is said that they often hunted their fellows. Uh, one of the night sorceries of Celia, town of sorcery, releases a life-sapping silver mist before the caster, dealing damage to all caught within, including the caster. Be below Celia, the eternal city of Nokron sleeps. This sorcery originates from the maidens of that place. Night Maiden's Mist. This looks almost like the mist that is cast by the Bloodborne friends, the Vulgar friends, as I've been calling, or not as I've been calling them, the Vulgar soldier, gosh, Vulgar something or other they were called. Sorry, everyone. But also it says below Celia. Okay, we have to look at the map after this. Oh, you noticed, did you? Indeed, Millicent did visit this hovel of a home. It seems the memories eaten away by the rotting sickness yet remain, but faintly. However, she has no need of me anymore. No, she must embark on her journey and stare her fate in the eye. I mustn't impede. As I've aged, I've found the best way to aid the young is to be forgotten. Okay, um, Sage Gowry I find a lot more interesting than I was originally giving him credit for. I was originally just sort of assuming that it's based on this weird posture he has, that he was sort of cartoonishly villainous, and he may still be cartoonishly villainous, but it does appear as though there's something a bit more complicated happening here. Um, you know, the least charitable reading would be that he knows that Millicent is going to do something that suits his interests, um, and so that's why he's just staying out of his out of the way so that he uh, he wants to be able to see it sort of play out. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll leave open the possibility that he's doing something a bit more nuanced here. Okie dokie. So I guess we'll just have to come back later. Um, presumably we will come across Millicent somewhere. Hmm. Okie dokie then. Let's head to Star Scourge Radon. The Star Scourge Radon Site of Grace. I don't know what to call this place. A field of ash or something like that. Oh. <laughs> it actually has a name. Wailing Dunes. Okay. So the site of grace is just where he was, but yeah, Wailing Dunes. Okay, that's pretty cool. So, first things first is the painting. I really ought to have known to explore this place in greater depth, and I guess I did. However, I was just thinking, like, We really have to go check out the impact site, this crater, like what is happening over here. And so I was a bit gung-ho. Okay, I laughed at some of the messages there, which suggested that you could jump down. Looks like you may in fact be able to do that. Very interesting. Although, I think we were, the messages were here. This is the Dragon Barrow, so... Yeah, we were only here, I think. Um... Oh, what else was I? Oh yeah, so, sorry. Sage Gowry. So it said that Nokron was beneath Celia, but that's not true. Nokron's like I guess kind of like Nokron's here, which is Nokron's here, which is like 
right near the border between Kaled and Limgrave, so I don't know what that thing was talking about. Oh, we're not going to be able to see whether... Gosh darn it. Because of the fog. Whether we have the right spot for the painting. It may in fact be up there. Yeah, this does not look like normal rain. Is it raining blood or am I just imagining that? <laughs> Or maybe it's like acid rain, but like, scar well, I guess if that were the case, if it were scarlet rot rain, then the... Then the, um, we would be getting some form of buildup. What the heck? Okay, those are tree roots. I thought that was like a dragon scaling the side of the cliff or something. So it's basically all the way at the end, it looks like. Or yes. So we are going <laughs> to, I am going to war dead catacombs. I am going to light the site of grace. We are going to warp away, but we will be right back. Just so everyone knows we are going to do it. However, I want to check out this painting first and see if we can figure that out. So don't worry, we'll be right back. We're not leaving this for a later date, just later in terms of like five minutes. <laughs> um, where is the closest? I guess this is the closest site of grace. So we are going to have to run past the dragons and stuff temporarily, which is fine. Although, again, we will return to that as well. Okay, so... Be there or thereabouts. Unless we can, in fact, jump down here. Let's see. No, that looks very far down. <gasps> oh, that was close. Gosh darn it, okay. Yeah, and I was trying to avoid it, but it looks like we have to just run past the dragons. I realize we didn't super thoroughly explore this area, but that is a massive dragon friend. Oh, 
Uh oh, alarm system activated. <laughs> yeah, I think this is it. What is this buff? It's a debuff. Uh, I'm sure there's some way to figure out what that debuff is, but who are you? an ultra holy opera friend oh my gosh you have so much HP or is it just that I'm that weak with this debuff uh oh that's bad Ouch. <laughs> it really serves me right, doesn't it? Oh my goodness, look at this guy here. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I hope that uh, everyone who worked on this game is extremely proud of the work they did. And I know that I often put FromSoft on a pedestal as far as like... their standing in relation to other developers and publisher. Well, I guess they're not a publisher developer, but... Yeah, I give them a pass in some instances when talking about the more problematic aspects of the gaming industry. Um, and yeah, I do sincerely hope that those who contributed to this game were not explore. you know, to some degree, everything we enjoy in terms of like capitalist products exploitation is just an inherent part of it that you're benefiting from the exploitation of others and I'm, I'm sure this is no different but you know certainly the like all the electronics involved in playing a video game and the internet and all these other things are all built on exploitation um and you know we can't live in any world other than the one in which we live so of course you know you can't fix everything yourself um but yeah it, it does help at minimum to keep these things in mind and to be mindful of them but yeah i certainly hope that those who helped build this game are very proud of their work and i hope they weren't exploited to such a tremendous degree okay so do we just leave this person do we maybe kick them off the cliff do we use a charge attack? Because this debuff, I don't know what it's doing, but I'm tempted to just try and kick them. I don't think that's going to work, though, because they can technically fly. So maybe we'll try a charge R2. Gosh darn it. We did it. Golden Rune level 9, okay. Okay, so... Oh, 
Oh, stop it. <laughs> oh, silly bat. Um, hmm. Is it there? I think it is there. Right next to the minor Erd tree. Gosh darn it. Okay, you know what? Maybe we will return, you know, I thought the painting thing would be easy. Okay, we no longer have the debuff, so that debuff definitely came from the dragon. Which is interesting, but that could also be a major problem for us. Oh, are you joking? Like, I understand there was a spirit spring right there. However, when you factor in the double jump, there's no way that, and you know, granted, I've talked about this before, the idea of kill volumes, that it doesn't matter what the fall distance is. If you pass through a kill volume, you're dead no matter what. Um, but yeah, I think it's silly that in that case, we actually died because, uh, yeah, anyways. I guess we'll go to the Spirit Spring. I was trying to avoid another debuff, but, but there it is again. So it lowers your defense and your attack power, it looks like. Based on the icons in the upper left. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's there. I was very confused for a second there, thinking maybe I went to the wrong place. This one we've already activated. Yes, and found the corresponding catacombs. Oh, just leave me alone. Oh, you have lots of HP. <laughs> His head just sort of pops off. Okay, I feel like that doesn't look as far. When you're further away, but when you're right up close, okay, I can see now. <sighs> yeah, there's no way. From a distance, it looks possible, but the closer you get, the less possible it looks. Likewise with that spot there. Too high up, yeah, indeed. Okay, so yeah, we will have to come back to the painting. Because it looks like it might be around, like we have to actually progress through Grail's Dragon Barrel before we can find it. Which is totally fine, because yeah, the paintings, the items associated with the paintings have not been too tremendous up to this point, so yeah, I don't feel like that's such a big deal. Okay, War Dead Catacombs. Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> Immediate flashback to Dark Souls 1. This is 
if my memory serves me correctly, almost exactly how the catacombs proper in Dark Souls 1 begins with a sort of gaping abyss to the side and a set of stairs leading down. Okay, there's a battle going on in here. Spirit Rai Lucaria friends, or bannermen of some description. Oh, I unequipped my. Gosh darn it. The battle is happening everywhere. Oh, of course, it's Scarlet Rot buildup. Okay, so Clean Rot Knights. Wow. Okay, this is very intriguing stuff. That's really sad though. It's the war war dead catacombs, so you know they're not resting. This is the resting place of all the, the dead from the shattering. Or well, presumably not all the dead, many of the dead I should say. And yet it's not a place of rest. They're just eternally sort of playing out the same conflict. So in the previous episode, or the episode prior, I uh, jokingly said, Oh yeah, I don't think we have the right kind of boluses we need for a Scarlet Rock buildup. But of course we did. It's preserving boluses. But we only have four of them. So we do need to be We can't be too liberal with how we use them. Or rather I should say we shouldn't use them too liberally. Oh what the heck? Oh you you troll, can't you see I'm watching the show? <laughs> well played though. Oh. <laughs> These imps. It's funny, now that I'm no longer one-shotting everything, you can see another one of the strengths of this weapon, the greatsword. Wow, well played, friends. In that, um... Okay, maybe I'll let them finish each other off, and then I'll come back later, so then that way we're not dealing with them plus the rot, and we can just pick up the items in peace. Um... Oh, gosh darn it, I completely lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? <laughs> Apologies, everyone. imp friend oh yes another one of the strengths of the weapon <laughs> just says it happened which is uh, its poise break ability that you know uh, it's very difficult to poise break someone or to you know render them vulnerable to a critical attack when you're one shotting them but now that we're actually hitting friends with more than one shot you can see They actually hurting each other? I'm not sure that no, I guess they are. And yeah, so you can see very 
clearly that one thing this weapon does quite well is break poise. There's a chest here. Collapsing stars. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, I hate it when they do slow walks. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a. Okay, that's a cool attack friend. I'll give you that. Okay, so now the question is do I want to. Dreadful parry attempt. Do we want to cure the Scarlet Rod? I don't know what killed us last time in the previous episode or the previous recording session. We were inflicted with Scarlet Rod, and I didn't think that it would actually be enough to kill us. And certainly our HP. I don't think our HP drained. And yet we died so after a short time, so I don't know what that was. But as I mentioned, I have not done edi any editing on that episode, so it's possible that I missed something fairly obvious. Dreadful. Oh, that was very close. Okay, we need to heal very quickly. Yeah, I should have just alleviated this Scarlet Rod. One more hit, the po poise break. No, gosh darn it. There it is. Wow, okay. Just want to make sure that we have picked up everything here. Oh, leave me alone. Oh, oh I guess you were leaving me alone. I'm sorry. This is where the imps were, I believe. Yes. Oh, I deserve that. Okay, that's everything down here, it looks like. So I think we'll leave these friends alone. <laughs> We're dead. Yeah, um, it would probably be fair to say I pushed it a bit too far there. So I'm just going to try to ignore all of these friends. You're not making it easy, friend. Oh, 
Oh, great bow one up there. This is one of the more interesting dungeons we've come across, I have to say. So yeah, you know, fairly f obvious that the dungeons were going to get more complicated with time. And so perhaps I was a bit hasty in... I wouldn't say I quite wrote them off, because if I had written them off, then we wouldn't still be doing them. But yeah, I suppose I should have been a lot more patient in terms of my assessment of the early catacombs. Okay. What sort of comfort is there here? Doesn't look like there's any. Grave Glove War at level 6. So this would be another one of those... easy farming areas in the sense that you know I discussed earlier that yeah there are certainly more efficient farming areas than the ones I've used in the playthrough up to this point however the farming I've been doing has been essentially low effort farming that again I talked about earlier you know farming at like 7 38 in the morning when i have time before work starts but don't feel like actually logging in yet so i'll do some just sort of mindless farming and the mindless farming i enjoy doing is often just uh time for jumping um is yeah the, the easy sort of farming that you can do Um, when you can sort of have the enemies fight themselves and reap the soul rewards for doing that, or the, the rune rewards, I suppose. Gosh darn it. The blood scenes in here, I suppose. <laughs> no surprise. Some imps here. Many imps. Tell me these friends are on the same side as the imps. Yeah, I gotta say, the clean rot knights that you find in that swamp are nothing compared to these friends. And I wonder if it's that the clean rot knights you're finding in the swamp are, you know, 
It's not just that they're past their prime, but like they're literally just walking corpses. Whereas the spirits, these spirits are like the clean rot knights sort of in their prime. I don't know if that's how we're supposed to interpret the differences between them. Or if, you know, they were just simply clean rot knights with weaker stats. Lower stats, I should say. Not sure. There you are. Oh, imp friend. <laughs> Gosh darn it. Radon Soldier Ashes. Ashen remains in which spirits yet dwell, used to summon the spirits of two of Radon's soldiers. Both spirits wield fiery weapons to perform powerful skills, such as their valor that they will immediately attack after being summoned. General Radon's soldiers were all reputed to be masterful warriors, and it was popularly said that the Red Mains knew no weakness. Alrighty. So it's now um, Saturday, April 8th at 6.50 in the morning. <laughs> I had to do a save quit, ran out of recording time, and now this great bull friend is just <laughs> staring through this window. So it's going to be interesting to deal with this person. Whoa, okay. Oh crud, that's bad. Can't you warp through the door, friend? Ouch, okay, that's bad. Gosh, the lever's right there, too. UI frames. <laughs> oh. Okay, it's apparent from that boss fight that I am not fully awake yet. <laughs> I did it. Yeah, me too. Thank you. And uh, well done. Why is it always chaos? Uh, I do find it amazing that they, yeah, this whole thing, I think, is pretty, pretty cool. So this... Trying to make sense of where I am. That's the boss room, obviously, although we only have one flask, so we might want to rest at the bonfire slash site of graze. However, I'm not sure that we've explored everything because there was a corpse in the middle of the floor there that I do not remember seeing previously so this isn't the main room this is one of the side rooms seemingly okay let's see what is in this pool of 
scarlet rot beneath us. Because I guess that's probably the last thing. As I've said previously, you can always tell when I've saved, when I've quit and started it again, when the lantern has changed its state. Okay. Oh, okay, we have looted that. Okay, so we've looted this area down here. Otherwise, that chest would not be open. Please forgive me as um, I just regain my bearings. Oh, okay. So the site of grace is right up there, and the boss room is right down there. So, yeah, that is the main room. So let's just have arrested the site of grace, because I'm reasonably certain we've done everything now. Wow. We don't actually have enough to level up at this point. We do. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Because I don't believe we really earned any of that, but I will take it, certainly. After we get to 20 mind, I think we'll maybe level up our vigor a little bit further. Maybe boost that up to 50. Take the long way around. <laughs> Thanks, friends. Take care. Hope you don't end up fighting each other for all of eternity, even though that's a, what appears to be happening. <laughs> Is this going to be one of Radon's knights or something? Putrid Tree Spirit, okay. Okay, this is gonna be a bad, bad boss fight. Oh gosh darn it. Real bad. Ouch. Brutal AoE that. Oh, rolled too early. We really need to figure out how to make preserving boluses, because I don't know how we're going to get through this otherwise. Oh, that was close. This thing really is spastic. All about dodge, <laughs> panic dodges this boss fight. Oh, oh! We are going to want to summon Latena for this. So, yeah. Just put it.
putting everything in the correct order. Well, how did we miss this glove ward right here? Whoops. Okay, so flask first. Order's Blade, Cerulean Tears after we summon Latena. Thankfully we have a second before... Ouch. Oh no. She's not going to last very long. Shout out to Latena. Sorry, I just <laughs> taking a drink of coffee, catching my breath. Thank you, Latena, kindly for your ooh, much needed service. Golden seed and red main knight Olga, was it? Olga, indeed. Spirit of a mighty knight versed in the use of a great bow. A valiant warrior who will attack immediately after being summoned. The longest serving member of the Red Main Knights, Olga, studied techniques to manipulate gravity alongside Bredon. May use a rain of gravitational arrows in response to a war cry, but only once. Interesting, so if you have war cry equipped, that actually modifies the way the ashes behave, which, yeah, is a really cool touch, I think. Yeah, I don't know how long, like, I suppose the first time we did get the boss very close solo. So, you know, I could have just tried again, but yeah, I, I'm not keen on spending all of my free time recording today fighting a tree spirit boss because we've already fought one. And yeah, I didn't find it <laughs> all that fun or engaging the first time. And I think we fought three of them now. I can't even remember, but Anyways, lots of friends here returning to Roots, as usual. The boss room itself is larger than we usually see it, um, but I imagine this is probably the same size as the other Tree Spirit boss rooms because need a bit of a higher, oops, need a bit, a bit of a higher ceiling in order to facilitate uh, a boss that size. So, 67,000 runes. Wow, so we almost have enough to level up once again. So at this point in the game, the game is just throwing runes at us, essentially. No need to warp back, because <laughs> we can walk through, reactivate this fight once more. Potentially gain some additional runes in the process.
just want to level up one more time, friends. I apologize. <laughs> Gosh darn it. Okay, now we have enough to level up. <laughs> Okay, more than enough. Wow, holy moly. So, yeah. <laughs> Insofar as we need to farm, I think this is the place. But, yeah, I think we're good as far as farming goes for now. Okay, well... That's going to do it for this episode, so thank you all very, very much for joining me, and I will see you in the next one. Bye! Bye.